Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 120, I chat with Dave Duncan of Texas Instruments about DLP technology. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded July 16th, 2012. Episode 120, Millions of Mirrors. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, online editor of HomeTheater.com. This week's guest geek is Dave Duncan, the business manager of DLP Cinema for Texas Instruments, and we're going to be talking all about DLP technology today. Hey, Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott. How are you doing today? Doing just great. How about yourself? Fine, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Um, DLP technology is something that has always fascinated me and most home theater geeks I know, so we're going to get deep into it. Before we do, I want to make sure that everybody knows, uh, those of you who are tuning tuned in live to live.twit.tv or in the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Dave, and I'll pass along as many as I can. So, Dave, let's start with how DLP came to be and explain something about the technology. When, when was it invented? How did it come about? Well, DLP was actually invented um, way back kind of in the mid to late 80s by an engineer at Texas Instruments, Dr. Larry Hornbeck. And there's a lot of different stories of, of how he invented the technology, but I, I believe one of the legends, maybe we'll call it a legend, is <laughs> he was driving out in West Texas, and he was kind of noticing how light reflects uh, off of his uh, rear view mirror. And he kind of thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we could control light in a digital manner? And so he started working in our central research lab on this idea of, of digitally controlling light. Uh, believe it or not, the first devices he created uh, were called deformable mirror devices. Uh, that's, that was the, the acronym for DMD back in those days. Mm. And the mirror was actually thin enough silicon that it actually would deform to create uh, or to steer light from one direction to another. Um, along the way, he realized, as well as the rest of the team working on the technology, that a, a solid mirror that would tilt you know, one way or the other, approximately uh, plus or minus 14 degrees, might be a better way of digitally steering the light. And so we changed the fundamental structure of the pixel technology in, in kind of the early 90s. And in 1996, we launched our first production-ready projection systems. And um, I guess, as they say, the rest is history. Indeed. Now, what's what's so fascinating about this is it's a light modulator. Light, and there are several different types of, of light modulators, which basically take a, a light coming in and individual pixels can be brightened or darkened uh, right. depending, depending on what you need, what the image needs to look like. And in the case of uh, DLP... It can, it's a chip. It's a silicon chip, just like any other chip, except that it's covered on the surface with uh, literally millions of tiny little mirrors, as you, as you mentioned. And I think we have a picture of um, a close-up, a graphic representation anyway, uh, Mirrors 1, uh, for John to pull up there and be able – we can see what that kind of looks like. We can talk about it while he's loading, while he's loading the graphics. So – yeah, the way I like to describe that, well, let me hold up this device and kind of get, oh, people can kind of get an idea of what the device looks like. Um, this is actually our, our 1.2 inch um, 2K device. And so in this device, there are over 2.2 million micro mirrors. And these mirrors can, as you said, they can independently flip plus or minus uh, 14 degrees. And so the way I kind of like to, to talk about this or visualize this, I, I don't know, back when I was at Purdue University and, 
you know, we'd go to a football game. We had this thing in the end zone called the card section. And all these students oh, right, would hold course. these cards up, right? I, Remember right. that? You'd hold these cards up in, in, in unison, and, and each one would have different colors. And the further away you were from that, you could actually see, you know, what see an image. Well, so imagine that on a microscopic scale where we have uh, actually in our 4K device up to 8.8 .8 million mirrors. Each one is able to move uh, several thousands of times per second. And the way we work our grayscale, if you have that mirror on uh, more than off, or let's say on and the majority of the time, then, then it's, a, it's a brighter shade of gray. If you have it off more than it's on, then it's a darker shade of gray. And then we take that grayscale and we add color in a couple different ways. You can, you can have three chips, which one each, each chip would be dedicated to either RGB, or we have color filtering systems uh, using a, a color wheel in our one chip device, our one chip projectors, and that's how we add color. And then you, you end up ultimately getting the, uh, the full spectrum of the rainbow. So it's a, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a very, very difficult uh, uh, technology to describe. It, it fascinates me every time I'm trying to explain it to somebody. <laughs> because people always ask, well, how do you make these things? You know, I mean, they're so small, but it's just, you know, the great thing is it's, it's using standard uh, Texas Instruments um, wafer processing. Um, and then we, then we build the mirror technology on top of that. So it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, the, the, the benefits of this technology, it's fundamentally stable over time. You know, it's extremely reliable, reliable. We've had projectors and movie theaters now for over 10 years that are still working very, very, very well. And, sure. um, and, you know, using the speed of these mirrors, we can, uh, and, you know, and, 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 the, and the fundamental pixel technology, we literally have chips and I've got a little, little thing here I can I can show you. Let me see if I can get this lined up just right. I have, I've got to work with the latency of the camera here. Right, exactly. You can see, yeah, so you can see all the way to one side is a 4K chip, the biggest one in this, in this uh, demonstration here. And then all the way to the other side is a little Pico chip that we actually have now in digital still cameras, digital video cameras, and actually um, just recently announced in a new uh, Galaxy uh, a beam mobile phone from Samsung, a little little handheld projector in a phone. So, you know, the fundamental uh, benefits of the technology, you know, the, the fast uh, the fast speed of the mirrors and and the uh, the size of these pixels allow us to do a wide range of chip uh, chipsets. I think we have the uh, graphics now, and I, I want to show uh, the one called Mirror One, which is a very close up view of a little tiny section of the chip. And you can see how the mirrors tilt one way and the other. That's right. And it's, it's, those mirrors, by the way, uh, range from 13.7 microns all the way down to uh, 5 microns. And what you see underneath the mirror there are, uh, are, are CMOS memory cells. And so we, we use a biased voltage, either a, a positive voltage or a negative voltage, to pull that mirror one way. And then we can release it, and then the opposite voltage will pull it the other way. So we, we'll be very, able to see that in, in Mirror 2, in the graphic called Mirror 2. Uh, we, we will be able to see a little bit more of what's underneath the, uh, the, the mirror. There, there, there we can go. see it. Yeah, now you can see the hinge. You can see the yoke that it pivots on, and then the electrode. So it, it, <clears> it's, a, uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a miracle how this thing works. It's a miraculous little microelectromechanical machine that we call the digital micromirror device. And each right. one of those pixels, as we said, is independently uh, controlled. Right. Uh, we should say that DLP stands for digital light processing, which is the overall name of the technology. And DMD, or digital micromirror device, is the name of the actual chip. That's correct. Okay. Now, it has always astonished me that, that ch mirrors can be made so tiny and that it's actually a moving part. And there are two, over two million moving parts on the surface of a chip that's maybe roughly, what, an inch on a side or no more than a yeah, couple the, inches on a side. Yeah, the smallest chips we have are, are, are 0.2 and then they go all the way up to almost 1.4 inches on the diagonal. Incredible. Just incredible. Um, and so I'm, what, what's amazing to me is that there's not more failure. I mean, anything with a moving part, there's eventually going to be a failure, right? I mean, it, the, 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 the physical stuff wears out after a while. 
particularly since these mirrors are pivoting back and forth many, many times a second. And I wanted to get to that uh, as a description of how you get different colors of gray. You were mentioning earlier okay. about about how uh, if the mirror, basically the mirror pivots in one of two directions, and that either sends the light through the lens and onto the screen or away from the lens and not onto the screen. Um, That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So for a pure white pixel, the light comes into the into the uh, the DMD and it's reflected right back out onto the screen. That's how you obviously get a, a bright white pixel. Then uh, the mirror, if you want a black pixel, absence of light, then the mirror flips in the opposite direction and the light actually goes into sort of a what we call a light absorber. And so the absence of light creates your black pixel. And then using pulse width modulation, um, you can vary, let's say uh, the, the, the mirrors are flipping thousands of times per second. And in that time, um, in, in, the, in that moment of time, if the mirror is on approximately half, half the time and it's off half the time, that's exactly a 50% shade of gray. And then you can just sort of carry that out from 0% gray all the way to, uh, or, or white, all the way to 100%, which, which is black. Right. So that's how we and get our, our incredibly... Uh, sort of smooth um, grayscale. Right. Because as the mirror flips back and forth, each time it flips, it spends more or less time in the on and off position, giving you that uh, those different scales of gray. Exactly. You got it. Now, now um, Woogie in the chat room is asking if we would explain the single chip projector technology. Uh, you mentioned a little earlier that there are basically two ways – to do a DLP projection system. One is with three chips, uh, mm -hmm. one, repre one representing the red, the green, and the blue. Correct. And the other, the other uh, using only a single chip. Uh, let's start with three chip because that is a little easier to understand. And I think, okay. uh, John, John, we have the three chip graphic we can pull up and uh, show what uh, a three, how a three chip DLP projector works. And this is what you're going to find in commercial cinemas and in more expensive home theater projectors based on DLP. As well as large venue projectors that you'll see in very, very large auditoriums and, you know, the rental and staging environment and so forth. And yeah. And so um, what you're looking there at there is a, is a, uh, is a representation of a prism assembly. So imagine white light coming into the back of that prism and then using uh, uh, color uh, uh, filters or, or um, you know, optical coatings, we split the white light into red, green, and blue. And so there's a DMD mounted on the end of each of those, uh, those uh, uh, parts of the prism that you can see in the, in the, in the photo there or in the, in the graphic. The white light comes in, it gets split into RGB. It illuminates up each DMD according to... Uh, to you know the color spectrum that's necessary at that time, and then it sends that light back out onto the screen. So um, I've actually got a, a. This is what the prism assembly looks like. I'm not sure how this will show up on on camera, but um, this is a prism assembly from a. Let me let me hold it still and catch up with the latency of the camera here. Uh, let's see here. We want to do it this way. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So that's a prism assembly from uh, this. This is a prism assembly from one of our 2K and 4K um, uh, DLP cinema projectors. So you can see where, if I turn it this way, this would be the output where the light would come out. And you can almost see the different colors in there because of yeah, all I, the optical coatings. Yeah, and yep, then I each, can. each one of these surfaces where these metal brackets are, there's one there. And if I keep flipping it around, there's another one here. That's where the uh, the DMDs would actually be mounted around this prism assembly. So yeah, it's taking you know it's the fundamentals of of the way we learn how to do colors in I guess primary school red, green, and blue. Um, we put them right back through the uh, the same light path right it through the projection lens onto the screen. So I that's must, how a three must, chip system works. That's how a three chip system works. I must make a little sidebar here and say what we learned at school was red, yellow, and blue because. Yeah. Those are the three primary colors for print, for paint, for reflected light. Whereas Correct. red, green, and blue are the three primary colors for emitted light. So I just want to make sure we make that distinction. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> now going on to one chip, 
this is this is amazing. This is found in less expensive uh, home theater projectors. And uh, if we can pull up the one chip uh, graphic, we'll be able to see that there's a single chip, a single DMD and a light source and what's called a color filter wheel. Why don't you take us through this? Yeah, so this is the traditional way up until probably within the last uh, couple of years, and we'll talk about some of the new technology here in a moment. But this is the sort of the traditional way of, of one, how one-chip projectors work. So we were talking about pulse width modulation, and so here we've combined the, um, the ability for a, for a digital micromirror device to have this, you know, this smooth grayscale with a color filtering system that would put RGB and actually, in this case, yellow cyan magenta color on, on the DMD. So now you have to consider, you know, what, what color um, each pixel needs to be. And, and you're timing the rotation of this wheel with the light that's coming through that, that color wheel. So let's say you want to have a, uh, a, a bright, you know, very uh, saturated color of purple on a particular pixel. So you're now timing the light hitting that pixel as the red segment comes by, as well as the blue segment. And it's happening, again, so fast. We're talking about mirror flips that are thousands of times per second here that your eye is sort of the final, you know, um, almost analog um, converter here that's putting all of those digital colors up on the screen simultaneously and creating the wide color, the color uh, gamut that these systems are capable of, of, uh, of showing. And so the color wheels, um, the great thing about this technology, our customers can choose um, uh, the number of segments in those, in those color wheels, RGB, um, yellow cyan magenta, the segment width and, and, and so forth in order to maximize colors depending upon um, do you want this to have a Rec 709 color space as an example? Do you want to go beyond that for, for more saturated colors? Do you want to do you want to maximize uh, the presentation for uh, for PowerPoint? Those kinds of things. So they're, they're pretty unique in their operation. So that's that's the traditional and and up to just the last couple of years, the, the the majority of the way that that light was put into a, a single chip projector. But now um, we actually are using uh, LEDs, RGB LEDs, as well as a, a, a hybrid laser phosphor systems to uh, to do. Um, you know, to put the light through a single chip projector, and there's there are numerous examples of those uh, available today that are that are quite stunning. And frankly, that's how we're able to go um, to reduce the size of the projector um, from traditional conference room projectors down to um, let me just grab this, but down to a projector that's inside a mobile phone. And so you can see there's the output right there lens. And so this is illuminated with um, with LEDs. Mm -hmm. So uh, all kinds of new technology, laser phosphor hybrid, as well as uh, LEDs that we're able to take advantage of now for um, single chip um, illumination as well. Now, how how what's the resolution of that phone projector? The resolution of this, I believe, is uh, it, it's either wide UXGA or NHD, and I I am not a hundred percent. It's this the the resolution of this projector is NHD. Sorry about that, and and, uh, okay, and it's I, phenomenal. Which, I, I wish which I means, could, wait, uh, uh, sorry, I wish NHD, I could demo it for you. I apologize. Uh, what what is NHD? I mean, how many by how many? Good question. Uh, NHD I mean, resolution. He's, he's trying to find it's, out. It's, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's it's one ninth the resolution of of an HD display. Okay, all right. So it's so it's quite a bit less. Three. And and I assume you can't have a picture very large on that. It couldn't fill a very big screen or area because LEDs typically don't have as much light output. Uh, plus the fact that they have to be in a, in a phone, so they can't be pushed too hard or they'd get too hot. Yeah, you'd be surprised. I mean, this this, this phone uh, projector is is uh, about 15, 15 lumens, 15 to 20 lumens in a dark environment. Um, it's pretty amazing that that the, uh, the, the, the power of, of a projector this size. Now, of course, um, you know, you can't compare that to, uh, to a conference room projector or, or, or a cinema projector. But for sharing uh, sharing video content, um, 
photographs and so forth for the kind of the one to many uh, gaming applications and and uh, rooms that are you know darker uh, environment. Um, it's been it's it's uh, you know we 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 actually at our booth at CES earlier this year at our meeting room we were showing uh, gaming um, games uh, up to screen sizes about 50 inches. So it, it's uh, it's pretty remarkable if you haven't seen them. They're uh, they're available today in uh, digital still cameras. Uh, they're available in, in digital uh, movie cameras as well. But there's also a wide range uh, of the smaller projectors that are everything from uh, from laptop accessories up to you know very very bright smaller conference room projectors. But it's just an it's an example of how we've taken the fundamental chip technology, the pixels that we were describing earlier, packaging them in very very small packages, taking advantage of the speed of the mirrors to create all these uh, uh, very, very unique opportunities for sharing content, uh, again, kind of kind of one-to-many as opposed to grouping people around these smaller devices. Sure, sure. Um, I've got several pick, uh, questions in the chat room, so let me, uh, let me post okay. a couple of them for you. So Cal Ray Jr. asks, uh, are, 4K, are 4K DLP chips available for the consumer marketplace yet, or are those only for commercial at this point? Right now... Yeah, right now uh, our 4K chipsets are just available in the in the uh, commercial market. Uh, I I assume they'll trickle down into the home market at some point, but not yet. It, that's correct. Yeah. Um, let's see. I had a couple of oh, there was some comment up here I just had to mention to you, uh, which was I can't find it now. But <laughs> if so, if someone breaks a DLP projector, is that is that 15 million years of bad luck? <laughs> <laughs> I just love yeah, that. I think you're right. Well, yeah, I, I, it's got to be something like that. Yeah. Lawn Dog in the chat room is asking, uh, if the response time in LCDs are like five milliseconds or four milliseconds or so, what is the response time for DLP? Um, much, much, much faster than LCD. We, we're, we're moving our pixel thousands of times per second. And so our, our our response time versus LCD is kind of a hard thing to measure. We're a digital mirror that we're flipping back and forth, you know, I, over two thousands of times per second. Um, so your LCD, response time is really in the millisecond. In the my, well, exactly. yeah, in the, in the uh, I've heard that that the response time is actually in the microsecond range. It's ten. I think it's ten microseconds. Is 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 the answer to the question? Right. Um, we don't, you know, unlike an LCD that's, uh, I know you know this, uh, the organic pixel that's got to rotate, you know, we're, we're flipping um, plus or minus, uh, you know, on off thousands of times per second. So, yeah, we're, uh, right. we're quite a bit faster than LCD technology. And that's, that's why typically you'll see in a DLP system, um, when you look at motion, uh, you don't see the kind of motion blur that you might traditionally see in some other types of, of display technologies. Right, exactly. Luis in the chat room is asking how many steps are are can the mir- how many different positions can the mirror be in, or, or is it an analog the positioning? And and I guess it's analog in the sense that that the mirror moves from one position to another, but there really are only two positions, right? That's right. There, the, when when the mirror is operating, the mirror is either on all the way or off. Now there is a flat state, but the flat state is is only really used when the system is is turned off. The mirrors kind of come back to what we call their park position and that's that's uh, you know, that's that's exactly kind of midway between on and off. But when right. the mirrors are flipping, they're flipping either all the way on or all the way off. And web 1 in the chat room is asking uh, what is the mirror latency actuation time from full black to full white? And that must certainly be in the microsecond range or even the it nanosecond is, range. It is, and I don't have that exact number of the the latency time between full off and and full on, but uh, <laughs> it's yeah, it's quick. Dan, Dan uh, your your PR guy, when we were setting up this interview, uh, said to me, "Well, now if you're going to be getting into things like uh, mirror actuation time, <laughs> and you know, of course, you know it might be you know it might be really fun for for your your uh, for you and your audience." Um, if if you know those kinds of questions, we we have we have DMD designers who would, would love to uh, to talk to the full capability of the device. Where we're talking about latency and uh, on off times and so forth, uh, it might make for a good follow up conversation at some point. Sure, sure. Well, let's let's you and I work on that. Um, 
But uh, in the meantime, Web9784 asks, how are the mirrors attached to the hinge? Well, it's it's uh, it's not glue. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, so that that's a great thing about about the technology is, I mean, it takes the fundamentals of semiconductor fabrication processes, which some people may be aware of, others may not, of, um, you know, starting with your wafer. We do metal deposition on top of that. And then we do the typical expose and, and sort of etch away the materials that you don't want. And so it's a combination of, of, of metal depth, um, etch, uh, get rid of, and eventually what you have is a mirror structure. And sort of the very final process is, is, the, um, is the removal of the final piece under the hinge that actually sort of frees the mirrors uh, so that they can now flip. It's a uh, it's a remarkable remarkable process, but it's you know f- for people who aren't aware of of how semiconductors are manufactured, it's not unlike exposing a photo. Um, you know, you, there, there's uh, but but just that uh, instead of instead of photo photo paper, we're now using uh, silicon. Right, right. Um, let's see. Uh, Eagle Pep in the chat room is asking: Has the rainbow effect been eliminated? We didn't talk about this with single chip DLP. There is something that some people are sensitive to called the rainbow effect. And that is because yeah. uh, the color wheel is rotating around and, and the red, green, and blue, and sometimes cyan, yellow, and magenta portions of the image are displayed sequentially rather than simultaneously. And as a result, under some conditions with some types of images, if you move your eyes around, you see these little quick flashes of rainbow. Uh, does LED illumination help with that? Yeah, it does. But let me go back and, and address the, the first part of the question. So um, it's true in the early days that that was an issue that that we uh, that was that was a result of some of just RGB color wheels that were operating at slower speeds. Let, let, let's let's in fact go to 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 uh, cinema, because that, is, uh, of okay. course, is is where we uh, where we see the introduction of technologies very often before it gets to the home for example we have uh 4k dlp uh cinema projectors or at least your your chip is is now available and i know that christy and barco i think are making 4k digital cinema displays or projectors right that's correct yeah barco christy and nec all have dlp cinema projectors available in 4k resolution in addition to um three different sizes of, uh, of 2K chipsets. And so the idea there was, you know, as you, I know, uh, are well aware, based upon, I think, a presentation just a few short weeks ago, the DCI standard was released with both 2K and 4K resolutions. And so we kind of believe from the very, very earliest uh, um, uh, development processes of our DLP cinema technology, it was important to make sure that you had the right chip sort of for the right, the right screen. So that's why we fundamentally have ended up where we are, where we have the family of, of, of uh, a po- our newest 0.69 S2K chip, the 0.98 chip, the 1.2 chip, and those are all 2K, and then we have a 1.38 inch diagonal 4K chip. So um, our, our, our customers, customers in the theatrical market are, are, um, are fully now uh, 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 capable of, of purchasing whatever it is they would like to have with regards to 4K or 2K. Um, and I want to get more into the deployment of DLP into the digital, into cinemas and the transition from film to digital cinema. But if you'll give me a moment before we get to that, uh, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Netflix. And, of course, uh, you can use a DLP projector or any type of display, uh, including smartphones and tablets, uh, your TV, your computer screen. Uh, Just about anything will display Netflix streaming, and uh, just about anything will accept Netflix streaming. Uh, And any consumer electronics device you can name probably has a Netflix app on it that will let you stream thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to your PC or your TV your projector, uh, your smartphone, your tablet, uh, all instantly, saving you time, money, and hassle. You can even start on one device and finish on another. It's uh, the ultimate inconvenience. For a free 30-day trial, be sure to go to netflix.com slash twit. 
And be sure to use that URL when you're signing up for that 30-day free trial. Those few of you watching who are listening who might not already have Netflix, that's uh, netflix.com slash twit. And we thank Netflix so much for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit Network. So getting back to uh, digital cinema, give us a little overview of, of the transition. Obviously, for close to 100 years, we had film projection in commercial cinemas. And now that is changing and we're moving to, to digital cinema. How has that been going? How, how far has it penetrated into the marketplace? Uh, what's, what's going on with that? Yeah, so it's it's uh, taken us some time. We started developing projectors for the digital cinema market using DLP cinema technology probably as early as 1998. Um, as you know, it, it took a little while uh, for the industry to sort of catch up with uh, with our technology development, and we showed our first 2K system kind of back in the in the early 2000s, and that's when our customers started to deploy small numbers, but. In 2002, of course, DCI was formed by the six major studios, and a couple of years later, the uh, the DCI standard came out. And I think that's when. And by the way, you know, the by the way, that stand that stands for Digital Cinema Initiative. Just for those who don't know. Yeah, Digital Cinema Initiatives, correct. And so, um, so now, once there was a document that described to the industry the sort of minimum acceptable requirements for uh, not only a, not only a digital cinema projector, but also the playback system and the theater management system and the distribution methodology and packaging of the the content. Um, that's really when I think the the deployment started, uh, in, you know, to, to grow. However. Um, you know, it was kind of a slow and, and steady growth. And then the hockey stick part of the curve really came along with Avatar. And I think when when James Cameron first started talking about his vision of Avatar and, and 3D and, and how digital was going to enable that in ways that, that maybe film couldn't achieve, um, we started seeing a significant increase in, in, customer, uh, in customer demand. And so you really do see that significant hockey stick, you know, kind of in the early to mid-2009 range. And so then once the success of Avatar uh, was, I think, well-recognized by the worldwide cinema industry, you know, the growth has just continued up to the point where today we have over 65,000 screens deployed worldwide with both uh, the majority of them being uh, DLP Cinema 2K projectors, but also some 4K as well. And, uh, and that continues to grow. I mean, we, we've had uh, just incredibly successful years over the last few. Uh, we're looking forward to The Hobbit coming out later this year, and I know we'll, you'll want to talk about that, kind of pushing the next-gen version of this technology with high frame rates. And, um, you know, so if you think about there's around, depending upon who you talk to, between 120 and 150,000 screens worldwide, you know, we're somewhere a little over halfway there if, if you kind of consider the 120,000 of the ones that are likely to convert because there may be some that just for whatever reason, um, you know, conversion may not be something that uh, that theater would do. But um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's where we are. We've got 65,000 screens and roughly uh, about eight and a half out of 10 exhibitors worldwide who've converted have uh, have utilized one uh, of, of our DLP cinema chipsets that, that have been available to them. So we're, we're very happy and very pleased with those results. Now, how about 3D? Uh, how many of those 65,000 screens uh, have 3D capabilities? Do you know? Yeah, it's a little more than half of them. You know, what happened on 3D is it typically started with the large auditoriums in, in, in each uh, exhibitor's building. Um, but, you know, as... As the, uh, as the digital cinema projector was installed, the good thing is for many of the 3D systems that are available out there, they're uh, they can come back in and add those later and make the projector um, 3D uh, capable. So we're starting to see more and more uh, of the projectors that were installed initially just for 2D now being 3D ready as well. Um, frankly, many of the projectors that are being installed today, are, are uh, you know, they kind of go in 3D ready because... In the early days, there wasn't a whole lot of 3D content, but now, as you know, there's a there's a quite a bit of 3D content, and so you really do need to have more than just your one or two large, sort of uh, you know Friday night opening screens available for 3D movies. Right, exactly, and uh, certainly, as you said, 4K. Do, uh, what's the penetration of 4K right now? Probably not very high because it's no, pretty for new. For us, 
Yeah, for us, it's uh, you know we've had the chipset available since kind of the the late 2010 time frame, and it's it's probably a little less than 10 percent total. Um, mm-hmm. Really, mostly driven by in the U.S. Uh, a group called DCIP, which is uh, it's a it's a it's a group of uh, exhibitors, uh, AMC, Regal, and Cinemark, and so um, you know our our largest customer by far for 4K has has been Cinemark, but we have them all around the world. It's just, you know, we, you know, depending upon the size of your screen, I know this, this is going to be maybe somewhat controversial to, <laughs> to the people <laughs> listening because I, I, yeah. you know, I've, I've done my homework and I've listened to some of your previous, uh, some of your previous uh, 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 podcasts here, but our webcasts, um, you know, we've, we've taken uh, side-by-side images just like you're doing right now. Uh, we've put 4K on one side, we put 2K on the other side, and whether you use a 4K master or a 2K master, if you sit where I do in a movie theater and you're watching a movie, um, you know, I got to tell you, as 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 detail oriented as I am, it you know, it's very very difficult to tell. Now, if you're all the way down front, actually, we did an experiment with a Cinemark theater right across the street from us. You know, the first row, two or three, maybe you could see the difference with a, a simply test pattern. But beyond that, you know, it was a little difficult. So really what this becomes is, is an economic decision. Um, the quality is there. You know, they, they both are DCI compliant. You know, in the case of DLP Cinema, we're known for our, our, our bright uh, 2D as well as 3D images. We're known for our, our, you know, the high speed of our mirrors, which gives us the ability to do high frame rate today. And we're new, known for our contrast. And frankly, we're known for our long-term reliability. So the exhibitor as a choice, you know, they kind of fit the right size projector to their screen. And the good news is if you want 4K, that's great. You know, Barco Christian AC would love to sell you a 4K projector. If you want 2K <laughs> and you've got a, you know, you've got a, you know, a 20 foot screen or a 25 foot screen, they've got the perfect solution for you there as well. But of course, the other issue with regards to 4K is the studios, in order to make it worthwhile, in my opinion, other than having a really big screen, is having 4K native content. And That's for right. example, I went and saw uh, uh, Brave at the world premiere of the of the movie and they had a Christie, I believe it was a 4K projector, but it was up converting a 2K master. Yeah. yeah so, so, you know, the other issue is getting I, the studios to deliver 4K content to those theaters that have it if you're going to see any benefit at all. That's right. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, I think starting kind of in the mid 2000s, you know, there were some 4K movies that started to get released into the theater, but it was on average about three or four per year. It kind of peaked in 2010 with, I, I think the number is about 12 uh, 4K, you know, uh, originated movies that were distributed to, to digital cinema uh, theaters all around the world. Last year, there were, um, I think, uh, 10 and I think, or maybe 11, I don't remember the exact number. This year, uh, there have only been a few to date. So, you know, here's kind of our philosophy, and, and I know everybody has opinions about this, and this, this is just ours, you know, that we believe certainly you should capture in the highest re- resolution possible. I mean, there are some great new cameras in the marketplace today. We certainly believe that, that cinematographers uh, should be taking advantage of the highest resolution from a capture standpoint. Um, but, you know, we all know a lot of movies still today, a lot of the special effects, believe it or not, are still it's still 1080p. There's a lot of workflow that's still done in the HD world. And, um, you know, a 4K native movie, there is a price premium, a cost premium that you do have to, to, to kind of deal with. And the studios that we talk to, many of them anyhow, they haven't seen the return on 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 the investment from a distribution standpoint. Mm. But again, let me let me be clear on this. We certainly believe that from an from a capture and even archive, the higher resolution, the better. Distribution today, um, you know, it's predominantly 2K. I think it's because of of the economics and you know, as we just discussed, the majority of the projectors that are out there today are 2K projectors. Now, I've seen you know, going the other direction, 4K native down to 2K. Um, you know, I, I you know there. I, I would certainly rather see that than try to up res 2K to go up to 4K. I agree with you 100. percent Absolutely, that's that's going to produce a much better picture uh, overall. Uh, you mentioned earlier high frame rates, and I want to make sure we get this uh, this piece of the puzzle into our discussion. 
the uh, of course, as we know, Peter Jackson is shooting or maybe he's done shooting now uh, The Hobbit uh, at 48 frames per second. James Cameron mm -hmm. is expecting to uh, planning to shoot Avatar 2 at 60 frames per second. Can the DLP projectors that are currently out in the market handle these higher frame rates? And particularly in the case of The Hobbit and, and Avatar both are going to be in 3D. So they've got to to have some pretty high frame rates inherent in their technology. Are they going to be able to do it? Our Series 2 projectors can. Um, the Series 2 projectors that are, that are out today uh, with a software upgrade that we've already provided to our customers can handle... 24, 48, and, and 60 frames per second. As long as the um, the uh, the IMB or integrated media block, or some people now call it an IMS, integrated media server, is capable of of uh, passing that signal through to the projector. So mm -hmm. yeah, the majority of the projectors that are installed to date are series what we call our series two projectors are are ready. And actually, they're the projectors that have been used in the the trade shows so far that have shown, um, it's about a 10 or 12 minute clip of The Hobbit uh, at Las Vegas, the CinemaCon show was the first one where, where that was actually, uh, actually performed. And actually a year ago, we did that with some uh, test footage that, that Mr. Cameron shot that we, uh, we did for the audience sort of as, a, as maybe a uh, you know, first look at what the promise of higher frame rate can bring to the, to the, uh, to the movie going audience. Well, I saw that. I saw the Cameron footage, I think what you're talking about, at NAB this year. Uh, it was a demonstration of he shot some fake scenes, a medieval castle and right. banquet and yeah. so on at different frame rates. And just we looked right. at them one after the other. It was remarkable, just remarkable. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, obviously I was at the, the demonstration a year ago in Las Vegas when, when he when he debuted that content. And, and, you know, just like everything that, that James Cameron does, I mean, it was it was, you know, first class. I mean, from from the set to the actors to the to the you know, the, he knew what he wanted to capture to kind of show the difference between 24, 48 and 60. The difference between 24 and 48 to me was just unreal. I mean, especially that scene where. You know, you had all those knights and, 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 you know, the women sitting at that table with those, those chairs with all, all the vertical and horizontal lines. And he purposely did that pan um, fairly yes. quickly from one end of the table to the other that would just cause havoc with all the, the costuming and, the, and the, uh, the furniture in that room, which you saw in the 24 frame per second version. But then the 48 and the 60, of course, all of that was cleaned up. Now, the interesting thing is, um, I believe, and you can talk to him and he can tell you exactly what he did, but I think it was so good. He had to go in and sort of, sort of create some kind of digital motion blur so that it's still kind of maintained. And, and you saw this, I'm sure it's sort of that filmic look, but yet got rid of all that, all that motion stuff that you would see with those kinds of pans and scans in, in the 24 per, uh, frame per second world that we, we live in today. Exactly. And in fact, a lot of people object uh, similarly to the way they object to LCD flat panel frame interpolation, which is a different thing altogether. But when, when anyone, some people see this 48 frames per second and 60 frames per second, they complain that it doesn't look like film, that it looks more like video and, and therefore it's not as good. Uh, I myself don't subscribe to that argument, but a lot of people, I hear it a lot. <laughs> Well, you know, I think it's going to be just like 3D. And so if we talk about sort of the, you know, some of the pros and cons of 3D, um, you know, there are uh, movie makers like Mr. Cameron and Mr. Jackson and many others, uh, Michael Bay, who, who have proven they can do, you know, phenomenal 3D movies. And, and it fits the story and it's the right sort of tool for, you know, to enhance the storytelling. I think there's others that have tried to insert 3D um, into a story that maybe it, it wasn't, story appropriate let's put it that way or maybe they've tried to take advantage of some of the gimmicky part of 3d and and which is kind of non-theatrical in my opinion i really like the way uh, uh jim cameron did did avatar where you know everything started at the screen and kind of went back from there as he described yes. some of the very very early shots it was almost like looking into an aquarium i think high frame rate may be the same um there may be a need for some movies to uh to increase the frame rate from 24 to 48 or 48 to 60, and take advantage, whether it's a lot of motion or, or the difficult shots, whatever, that you know, it, it will enhance the story. 
And and I know that Peter Jackson, when he demonst- or demoed, um, premiered his content at CinemaCon for the very first time, uh, he couldn't be at the show because, of course, he was in New Zealand shooting. But he did um, introduce it via, you know, a, a pre-recorded uh, video. And he said, "Look, you know, I understand this is going to look different, and that's why I brought. I think it was either ten or twelve minutes of footage because I want your eyes to adjust to how this new um, way of showing a story on a big screen is going to kind of look." And 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 he he told people this was completely unfinished. You know, some of it was still green screen. I mean, it was it was like um, kind of hot off the hot off the the camera footage. And and I think some people kind of got it, and I think other people kind of looked at it and said, "Ooh, I don't know about that." So, but I know you know from talking to people who who work for him that when this is released in in December, I think we're all going to be amazed at 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 what he's able to do. From a storytelling standpoint, bringing in this new technology into the uh, theatrical space. Now, uh, a lot of people in the chat room are asking: When we get to these high frame rates in 3D, is it going to be 48 frames per second per eye, or is 48 going to be divided into 24 per eye? No, it'll be 48 per eye, or 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 60 per eye. So it's pretty challenging, and that kind of gets us back to that's why it's that's why it's really important to be able to flip those mirrors as fast as we can flip them today because the great right. thing is you know our engineering team when when given the challenge a year ago um I, I you know i was in i was in jim cameron's office and we called back to the team and said hey he wants to do this in two months literally and can we make it happen and and they're like yeah you know we just need to crank up the the, the frame rate of the of the of, of the of the signal coming into the projector and we were fine now at the time there wasn't anything to drive it that fast so we had to use some professional grade um, equipment to load his content on, but now of course all the all the server manufacturers, the IMB manufacturers, have caught up, and and so they're able to do that. But um, yeah, it, it's 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 great to have a technology with the flexibility of DLP because we can do all these things that we've talked about so far during the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I assume that you can you can also do the high frame rates. So someone in the chat room here is asking about uh, that you can do these. 48 per eye or 60 per eye uh, 3D at 4K as well. That The number of mirrors doesn't matter. They'll all just flip at the same speed, right? Yeah, um, yes, that, that, that's true. However, today, um, the chip, our 4K chip is capable of flipping fast enough to handle 4K content in, you know, at those frame rates. We uh, we didn't design the, the electronics that sort of send the signals onto the DMD with enough bandwidth to do that. However, um, our engineers are, are, they never cease to amaze me here. And given the challenge, (laughs) you know, we're working on that today. And, uh, you know, my belief is if they can figure out how to make these little 5.5 micron mirrors flip thousands of times per second without flying off, which they've done, obviously, they'll go figure that out as well. So yeah, we'll be ready for, uh, for full 4k content um, at 60 frames per second per eye when, when, when the content is available, which I believe will likely be, uh, Mr. Cameron's, uh, movie when it first comes out, when, when the next avatar too. Uh, he's going to do 60 frames per second in 3d and, and you think it's going to be released in 4k as well? Well, I don't know. You know, we, uh, last time we, we, we talked to him about it, um, which was, um, actually it was about exactly a year ago. Uh, he was still doing some testing to determine. Uh, I mean, he, I, last time I talked to him about this, he 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 decided for sure 60 frames per second. I mean, I'll tell you, um, James Cameron and Peter Jackson and Michael Bay, a lot of these guys, they all kind of have the same priorities. That number one, they want brighter 3D, and so so you know our customers are actively working on that with us. And and I know we'll probably hit lasers eventually, but that's where a lot of these latest demos on, on laser illuminated projectors have come from, as well as just uh, making more and more efficient optical systems to couple um, with our chips. But really, number one on their list is brighter 3D. Number two has been has been higher frame rate for guys like like um, uh, James Cameron and Peter Jackson, and some of these other guys. And then last has been spatial resolution. So um, the last I talked to him, he knew that, you know, he was asking for a lot from the entire infrastructure to go do um, 60 frames per second per eye, you know, 3D with 4K content. But but not unlike the first time he brought us all together 
when he told us about his vision of Avatar in 3D. And by the way, back then we we didn't have the ability to do even you know what he did with with Avatar. You know, we all went to work and 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 provided the solution for him because you know we when a guy like that talks, you know, we all clearly listen. And I think yeah. as we all know now that was a great thing to do, right? So right. so we'll see. You know, I I I haven't heard any any uh, recent updates from him, but. Um, Knowing, knowing Jim Cameron, you know he's going to want the the best, and if he considers, you know, 4K at 60 per eye, um, you know, at whatever brightness levels he's going to be searching for, we'll go figure out a way to make it happen. Well, now this is a question that is coming up uh, several times with several people in the chat room, uh, which is how can DLP technology improve the brightness of 3D? Which is, of course, one of the main complaints about 3D in the cinema and at home. Uh, because the glasses filter out so much light by the time it reaches your eyes, uh, it looks very dim. What can Texas Instruments and DLP technology do to combat that problem? Well, and and those are those are really good points. And I guess I can start by let's just back up just a moment and talk about film projectors. So film projectors with a brand new bulb that's you know scaled appropriately to the screen. If you pull the film out, so you you're just running kind of open gate. Um, the typical light level that that would produce onto a movie screen is 16 foot Lamberts. And so a foot Lambert is sort of a, um, it's a unit of measure that, that talks about light over a given area. Right. So right. then mm -hmm. when you put, so, so then to take it to the next level, which is where the SMPTE standard for, for digital cinema came from, when you put clear film, you just run, you know, a clear film, 35 millimeter film through a projector, you're already cutting the light back just a bit because now you've got something for the light to have to go through, right? And so right. that cuts it from 16 to 14 foot Lamberts. Mm -hmm. So 14 foot Lamberts became the the standard for you know the baseline of a 2D digital cinema projector. And right. so you know all of our customers as they were designing their very first uh, you know production DLP cinema projectors knew that that was the target and and you know, going back to the basics of how the DLP chip operates, we're a highly, highly reflective surface, as you can see, you know, when I, when I, I mean, you can just see how that, you know, it, it, it's, it literally is a mirror, right? So we're, you know, light in equals light out on a DLP chip. Now there's, there's, as the mirror rotates, we have to deal with, with, um, you know, the light that could, could kind of leak in underneath the, the pixel and so forth. But we, we've accommodated that through, through um, dark coatings and so forth. We've also um, significantly shrunk the gap between the pixels as well as the, the little dot in the middle where the, uh, the, the hinge post is. So, so we've done many, many things over the years at the DLP level to um, enhance the opportunity, let's put it this way, for the light to hit that pixel and get out on the screen. And now our customers then over the years have done really, really good jobs of creating super efficient optical systems and reflector systems for their, their xenon lamps to where 14 foot Lamberts through, through the wide range of, of, the, of the projectors that they have available really has become sort of routine for them. It, it's amazing to me. If you go take a look at the, the statistics, um, you kind of the bell curve for screens worldwide, it kind of centers around 32 to 34 feet. So that all the screens to the kind of the left of that curve, the ones that are, you know, down to, you know, 15, 20 feet, our customers can do a really good job of lighting those things up with, with very small lamps, three kilowatt, two kilowatt and 1.2 kilowatts. The larger screens need the larger lamps. Um, but they, you know, over the years, they've done a great job with optical coatings and, uh, um, cooling systems to make sure that they can, you know, couple all the light into the into the DMD, and 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 it's been phenomenal. So, 14 foot Lamberts for all of our range of projectors in 2D has been sort of the norm. Now you go to 3D because you're right. Um, 3D, you know, putting the glasses on and cutting the light, you know, for just a left eye or a right eye, that's that's going to take 50 percent of your efficiency away right there. And then right. you start talking about optical inefficiencies of whether it's a real D. Um, you know, lens out in front of the uh, the projection lens, or any of the other the master image system, the Dolby system, any of the other systems out there. You know, they kind of start at fifty percent and they go down from there. So, yeah, they're you know they're they're great systems, but they uh, they they really hurt us with regards to light efficiency. But the you know the good news about DLP cinema technology. Well, let me just let me just kind of say this: before the last Transformers movie came out. 
I know that um, they were very concerned about 3D light levels because there had been some kind of very negative reports written about people going into movie theaters and seeing some dim 3D movies, and it wasn't doing anybody any 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 favor at that point in time. Not us, not our customers, not the uh, theater owners, and not the movie makers. So they set a standard, kind of a second standard of six foot Lamberts, which it's really interesting that that sounds like a low number, mm -hmm. but but historically we've seen four, three, two, even literally down to a single foot Lambert in some of these theaters when you take a light meter in and measure it. Um, but but what we decided is you know the industry has kind of sort of kind of decided that four foot Lamberts might be a place to start. Um, hmm. They decided for Transformers that they wanted to shoot for six, and and uh, they were going to go out and screen theaters. And all of our customers um, have the ability to do six foot Lamberts. Many of them uh, have their lamps and their system set, so that's that's typically the minimum that they'll show. But it, but I know that we do have a problem out there, and that's why number one on the majority of the of the movie makers that we talk to, number one on their priority list from an image quality standpoint is hey, let's get that brightness level up. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, we've come to the end of a fascinating hour and I know there's much more to talk about. Uh, so perhaps you can come on again and bring along one of your engineers, would you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> no problem. Not, not I that, can't not believe that an hour has gone that, by already. I know. I know. It happens so fast. Not <laughs> we, that you haven't yeah, been we, very informative. You have and and you really know your stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, the chat room is merciless and they they want to know <laughs> flip rates and, uh, you know, microseconds yeah. and all that stuff. So um, let's let's do it again sometime, shall we? Certainly. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, you can all right. read all about uh, DLP technology at DLP dot com. Um, and you can even follow Texas Instruments on Twitter at T.I underscore DLP. My online home, of course, is hometheater.com, and you can email me at scott at twit.tv. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Martin Dornfeld, a, the senior engineer at Surgex, which is a power AC power management and conditioning company. So we're going to be talking all about the power that powers your home theater. Sure hope you'll join me then. Until then, geek out.